So hi everyone and welcome to this webinar on the future of American foreign and security policy. And this webinar will be the conclusion of um, this year's Helsinki Summer Session, which is an annual high profile event organized by the Center on US Politics and Power at the Finnish Institute of International Affairs. And it's usually organized here in Helsinki, but this year it was entirely virtual. But this year, um, uh, no, this webinar is also not just the conclusion of the Helsinki Summer Session, but it's also going to be the launch of a new monthly webinar series uh, in collaboration with um, our American friends. And um, it's going to be it's called Transatlantic Currents. And there's going to be a monthly webinar featuring distinguished American speakers who will be experts on political science or American politics. Oh, and my name is Maria Anala. I'm a visiting research fellow here at the Center on US Politics and Power at FIA. But without further ado, I'd like to hand the floor over to Deborah McCarty, a former ambassador who was recently a visiting senior fellow here at FIA and who is now a fellow at Harvard and the producer and host of a podcast series called The General and the Ambassador. Thank you so much for being here and hosting this, Deborah. Well, thank you, Maria. It's a great pleasure to be back with the FIA team, not only to wrap up the summer session, but to launch the seminar series, which you just mentioned. So we're going to call it Transatlantic Currents. And my another colleague who also did uh, some time as a senior fellow at FIA, Leo Michel, will be co-hosting, or he'll host one time, I'll host another. But without further ado, let's turn to the subject at hand today, which is a discussion of the future of American foreign and security policy. We're 61 days, if I have my days right, away from the U.S. presidential elections. And foreign policy um, is playing a significantly larger role in this election. Normally, this isn't the case, but with between the global pandemic continued discussions about Russian meddling in U.S. elections, among other things. The media is getting at least much more coverage of these issues as part of electoral coverage in general. So the Trump administration early on issued a national security strategy which has guided its foreign policy since its early days. It's often sometimes referred to as an American first strategy. It's been quite forceful and relatively consistent. We hear more about this in today's seminar and hope to get a sense of what changes, if any, would take place in a second Trump administration. As vice president, Joe Biden played a significant role in foreign policy during his time in the Obama administration. In the run-up to the election, he has a very, very large group of foreign policy advisors working with his team. But much has changed since he left office. The pivot in the public eye that has become even more negative about China, which I spoke about yesterday, obviously the pandemic, and new challenges such as data sovereignty, missile defense, and much more. And so today we'll try to get a glimpse of what would be some priorities in a possible Biden administration. Dr. James Carafano is the Heritage Foundation's Vice President for Foreign and Defense Policy Studies, as well as Director of the Catherine and Shelby Cullum Davis Institute for International Studies. He is a prolific writer, commentator, and teacher on U.S. national security and foreign policy issues. From 2014 to, two, excuse me, from 2012 to 2014, he served on the Homeland Security Advisory Council. He is a 25-year U.S. Army veteran and also runs a nonprofit called Esprit de Corps, which seeks to educate the public about veterans' affairs. Ambassador Kathleen Doherty is the Chief Strategy Officer at the Annenberg Foundation Trust at Sunnylands, what some call the Camp David of the West. Um, which convenes global leaders, including many presidential summits. Previously, she was the U.S. ambassador to Cyprus and held many other senior diplomatic positions, including deputy chief of mission at the U.S. embassy in Rome, deputy assistant secretary of state for European and Eurasian affairs, 
and Dean for Professional and Area Studies at the Foreign Service Institute, which is the university which trains all U.S. diplomats. So I'd like to first invite James to give us an outline, followed by Kathleen, and then we'll open it up to Q&A. So James, if I can invite you to take the floor, so to speak. Well, well thank you. First of all, let me, let me thank everyone on the call. Transatlantic discussions and dialogue is, is so important now more than ever. So kudos to you guys for organizing this. Uh, thank you to the participants for really, I think, one of the key strategic dialogues of the 21st century, and, uh, and, and it can't happen enough. So thank you. Thank you so much. Good to see you, Deborah. Say hi to Leo Michelle, my good buddy. Uh, okay, wish him well. I will. Nice, nice to see you, Kathleen. I'm, I'm envious. Happy to switch jobs anytime. Um, I think I'd like to focus my opening remarks uh, on uh, on the issue of continuity and change. There's always continuity and change between every American administration, um, even transition from one turn from the other, one political party to the other. And so I think the crucial question is always, what's that that balance? And I think I'd like to focus on continuities. You know, some things simply do not change. America is a global power with global interests and global responsibilities. That's the same the day after the election. Um, I think Americans widely recognize that we are an era of great power competition. I think our friends and allies, many of them see the world in that same framework. Many of our competitors in the world see that frame in the same framework. So re regardless of where you're coming from, um, the, the concern about the destabilizing influence of China, Russia, Iran, and North Korea, I think you know, that doesn't go away. You know, geopolitics continues on and regardless of the American elections. Um, there's a large element of bipartisan consensus on foreign policy in the United States that often gets uh, overlooked. I, um, I think right, left, Republican, conservative, there's concerns about the destabilizing influence of Russia on Western Europe, um, less so in the Middle East, but also some there. Um, Iran, and I, no American on either the left or the right is sanguine about the place of Iran in the Middle East. Uh, it is perceived as the chief destabilizing force in the region. We have maybe very divergent views on how to do this, but again, n nobody is, is sanguine about the Iranians. Um, China is clearly recognized as a, a significant uh, concern and its destabilizing influence in the world. So, uh, and North Korea, you know, nobody wants North Korea to have nuclear weapons. Nobody wants a war in Northeast Asia. So we build, we come in the United States at this from a a relatively broad base of consensus that I think is is not normally recognized. And of course, the day after the election, the allies, resources, tools, capabilities that you have are the same they were the day before. So the, this notion about significant shifts uh, just because of November 3rd or whenever our election will ultimately be decided, um, uh, I, I think it, it really focuses to help start looking at the continuity. So Deborah mentioned the, US, the um, U.S. national security strategy with this administration uh, put out when it first came into office. I think that's a document really worth looking at, uh, not just if, if there is a second uh, Trump term, but also you know, if, if, if there is a first term of another president. Uh, there's a lot of interesting, uh, in, in the, interesting thing in that document. It is the first national security strategy that really recognized uh, the elements of great power competition or the driving dynamics. Um, look, I'm, I, first of all, I'm not a Republican. I, I have no affiliation with the administration or the campaign. So everything I'm saying is as a complete outsider. Um, I did work on a transition team, but I will tell you, as a me member of the president's transition team, we, we didn't really know what the president's foreign policy was. I mean, uh, campaign rhetoric is, uh, a really poor predictor of exactly what a president's fulsome foreign policy is going to be. Um, and I, I think that's nowhere you know, true in this election. I, I agree with Deborah, Deborah, there's more discussion about Russia and China, but the reality is, is neither candidate is spending a ton of time really laying out a fulsome policy or strategy in the campaign. Um, so what was interesting about uh, uh, the Trump campaign was the national security strategy was really the first time we got a, a fulsome layout of, of what exactly the plan was. And it does reflect the, the president's genuine policy. I think um, H.R. McMaster and Nadia Shadlow did a great job of kind of getting inside the president's head. And, and 
you know, essentially it is a, uh, a, a strategy that's designed for great power competition. It's not out to solve the world's problems. It's not out to get disengaged and, and walk away from the world. It's out to see uh, the U.S. leaning forward to protect its interests, particularly in the critical parts the, for the U.S., which are Western Europe, uh, the greater Middle East and the Indo-Pacific. Uh, and looking, ironically, not to disengage from friends and allies, but really to get friends and allies to step up to do more because the United States, with a global range, really needs partners who have, you know, uh, you know a stake in the fight uh, to, to work with. Um, the interesting thing is almost like every other strat published strategy we've ever had since we started doing them in the 80s, they're either kind of, let's get everybody in a room and describe what we're doing and say that's our strategy, or they tend to be very aspirational. This is actually the first strategy that was actually a blueprint for an administration and which the administration actually followed that blueprint. So, I'll, you know, I'll summarize my remarks you know, very quickly in the sense that I think what a second term would be would be an extension of the first term, that the policies that you see now, you would see them continue because I, I think the administration sees its work that's not done. So, you know, there's a couple of variables there, and, and I think this is true for both sides. Um, uh, and I think... Uh, probably the biggest one to focus on is China. Unlike Russia, Iran, and North Korea, China has a lot of cards to play. I mean, you know, Russia can do some things tactically. Um, Iran has very few real options. Um, North Korea has very few practical options. China is a big, powerful country, and, and they can make choices. And regardless if it's a second Trump term or a first uh, Biden term, much of the U.S.-China relationship will have to be reflect how the Chinese decide to take that relationship forward and how we respond to that. So this is clearly a case where the other side gets a vote. The other big variable, and, 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 I, and I know Deborah and, and, and Kathleen agree with me, uh, the people that are surrounding Joe Biden are smart, seasoned, experienced people. Um, one of the things that they know is, is you can't just get in the way back machine and go back four years and we'll just pick up on the policies that we had four years ago. The world has changed. Uh, the relationship with China is significantly di different. Um, Russia, you know, it, Russia has run, run out of steam. They're, they're stalemated in Syria. They're stalemated in Georgia. They're stalemated in uh, the Ukraine. Uh, they're, they're, they, they're, 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 they're struggling in their own backyard in Belarus. Um, you know, Russia is not on, on, on the march. Uh, a Russian reset is not in the offing. Um, regardless of what folks think about the Iran deal, there's not going to be much of an Iran deal left to go back to. So even, even the notion of, well, we'll just ignore the last four years, I mean, that's not possible. And we're going to have to pick up where we are. And I, I think that's really the, the key thing for both presidents is they're going to have to pick up with the world they have, uh, both candidates, the, pick up with the world we have in January 2021 and, and see how we continue to protect America's interests and build relationships with our friends and allies in, in this era of great power competition, which will will be going on just as strong. I think the one thing that we've learned from COVID, and I'll end on this, is that COVID did not change global dynamics. If anything, global, COVID has accelerated uh, the competition. Uh, and uh, if, in, if there's a change, it's you know, who, which side recovers from the economic effects of COVID first, and how do they use that? But COVID has not derailed great power competition. It's kind of put it on overdrive. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you, James. And I like that. Uh, I'm going to follow up on that notion about it hasn't derailed or changed anything, but we'll talk about that later. So Kathleen, if I can invite you to. <laughs> sure. Thanks, Deborah. And thanks, James. Um, and thanks for the invitation for this. Uh, I always like to talk about transatlantic and U.S.-European relations and often the broader issues. And uh, James, you did a really nice uh, job of identifying some of the commonalities between the two potential approaches um, between a, a, a Trump two administration and a, and a possible Biden administration. I think there is a general consensus among the American public about certain issues that James identified, uh, China, Russia, um, concerns about rising authoritarianism. Um, some of the things that James maybe not have identified as some common concerns also is just growing fatigue with what we call the forever wars, um, Afghanistan in particular. So there is a commonality between the two uh, political parties and the people who support the two political parties. There are differences though, and I think some of the things that are important to note are the differences would be the emphasis. One is climate change. Um, I think the Biden administration has indicated 
that climate changes would be one among their very top priorities and that they would enter into the Paris Agreement as soon as possible um, and also make uh, climate change an important domestic priority and has a very robust emphasis on climate change. The other issue is that the Biden, Biden administration will also re-enter into some other agreements that the Trump administration has withdrawn from. Um, that includes would be the Iranian agreement, the JCPOA, but only in, under certain conditions. Um, the Biden administration also has indicated that it would like to um, extend the new start uh, for at least a year to possibly negotiate a new start agreement. So the re-emphasis on treaties is would be a very significant difference, I think, between the two potential administrations. Also, the re-emphasis on where um, alliances play a role. Uh, as uh, as James mentioned, a lot of people who support Vice President Biden in his campaign are NATO NICs, as we call them, or European hands, and really believe in the traditional alliances. But they also believe that NATO and other traditional alliances also have a role in kind of confronting some of the new challenges that are arising, including climate change, including China, potentially, and looking at some of things, including cybersecurity issues, that these alliances have a really significant role in addressing the global uh, problems. I also think um, the differences would also apply on the emphasis between diplomacy and military. The 2020 Democratic Party campaign uh, mentioned diplomacy and diplomatic efforts 20 times greater than it did in the 2016 um, political party uh, campaign. So the emphasis on the State Department on diplomatic measures rather than a, a military approach would be, I think, a significant change over a course of time, not an immediate change, of course, would be a gradual change. And I think that might be emphasized most particularly in the Middle East, where we might see a, a more robust uh, middle, uh, diplomatic efforts rather than a, a military focused. The other issues, I think, um, is also the differences is kind of the concern about the rising authoritarianism and how you might approach that. There aren't that many specifics of how this Biden administration would approach it, but I think the priority on the erosion of democratic governments throughout the world, um, Freedom House has noted how many fewer democracies there are uh, in 2020 than there were even four years ago, and how do we emphasize on how do we look at issues of human rights, um, democracy, treatment of minorities, will be much higher, I think, under um, a Biden administration. And then lastly, on, on kind of the global health issues, um, I think uh, the Biden administration would support WHO, uh, but also has also acknowledged that there needs to be new approaches to some of these pandemics, that some of these post-Cold War, um, post-World War II and Cold War institutions need to be redesigned, that they are they were fine for meeting the challenges of last century, but they're not sufficient to meet the challenges of today's century. And so that we need to figure out how to reform, reorganize, maybe create new ones in addition to existing organizations and institutions, but that the U.S. would have a key role in creating these institutions or refining or, re or redeveloping these institutions. And also wanted to have leadership in these organizations as well, to take a prominent leadership um, in those. So I think you'll see, um, you know, kind of a nuanced approach, as, as James saying, nothing changes overnight, except with the exceptions of some treaty agreements that the a Biden administration would, would likely try to enter in within the first 100 days. Um, I should say that um, we, treaties have a difficulty getting passed by a Senate. Um, so having a treaty ratified by a U.S. Senate is, is very difficult under any scenario, even if it is a democratically led Senate and a Democratic White House, it doesn't mean that a treaty would be ratified by the Senate. Um, but we have been in compliance with uh, treaties that we have not ratified, so a lot will depend on how we approach these these agreements. Um, but I think with that, I'll, I'll leave it, because um, those are the big overview. Um, I think the only one of the last thing I should probably say, I think uh, the Biden administration also will be looking at the impact of our foreign policy on our own economy and our own standing. And I think that's probably not that different from the Trump administration about how they approach what, you know, you look at the issues of supply chains and our dependency in other countries for supply chains, especially in the COVID issue. I think we've learned a lot about how we domestically have to respond to foreign policy or foreign affairs or global challenges. And we will be, obviously, the Biden administration would be recasting some of the approach.
So I hope that generates a good beginning of a conversation and I'm sure we'll have some really good questions. Well, before we open up the floor, I wanted to ask the two of you a couple of questions. Um, Kathleen, you just mentioned the need to adapt, change, reform post-World War II institutions and perhaps create new ones. Even under the Obama administration, they didn't really move forth to, uh, they moved on doing things like the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, but they never joined you know, the Asian Development Bank for lots of reasons. Mm -hmm. um, and as the, the shape of world trade has been adjusted somewhat um, by, by COVID, but also by a decoupling that's taking place uh, between the US and China, on the trade side, I would expect that a Trump administration would not, would be consistent, not go back to a TPP. They having discussions with the UK on a trade agreement. An Obama, excuse me, a Biden administration could perhaps go back to some of the old ways to seek to revive some older style agreements. So would there be a difference between the two administrations vis-a-vis, -vis, let's say, the institutions that uh, play a huge role in international trade, such as the WTO, for example. Yeah, well, even having a, a head of a WTO right now would be important <laughs> since we don't have one right now. <laughs> but uh, I think, you know, again, and then, like James, I don't work for the campaign. I just um, know a lot of people who work for the campaign and a lot of people who are advising the vice president on, on the approaches. But on trade issues, I think we have learned a real acute lesson from COVID about the disruptions in supply chains and our dependency on other countries for key critical um, components, so whether it's it's healthcare related components, whether it's some of this basic supply chains, even between the borders of the US and Mexico were really disrupted because of COVID. So I think you'll start seeing an analysis how trade, will two trade agreements actually help or hurt supply chains and how do they factor into it. I do think you would see um, any trade agreements under a Biden administration have much more focus on labor rights, um, common climate change issues as well, because that's consistent with kind of the approaches. But I think the big difference in those four years would be the impact on supply chains and our ability to really protect ourselves um, for, for major disruptions of which we have no control over. Uh, these un the black swans, the disruptions that, that are not foreseeable at the moment. So how do we protect ourselves? James, do you want to add anything? Yeah, so let me let me talk a bit about trade, and then I would like to pivot back to the international organizations issue, which I think is really, really significant and important to discuss. You know, on the, on the trade side, and I think that, that Kathleen and, and I kind of share this assessment of where America are going, I, I think we see a notion about, you know, we still want free enterprise, and we still, but we think that free enterprise is best going to be achieved by the by the, the common, by trade, by the free world. So I think the turn the free world is actually mm -hmm. coming back. I mean, yeah. fundamentally the difference yeah. between the United States and China is, and regardless of where we are, you know, we believe in human rights. We believe in freely elected governments. Uh, um, we Oops. believe oh, in freedom. The does not believe in those things and actually right. sees those three things as impediments to the expansion of their power. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's the, the notion of, well, we, we want to be neutral in this competition between the United States and China. I, I think both sides of the middle American political spectrum see that as, as unsustainable in the world that we're going. Not that not doing business with China. We're all going to do business with China. We're never going to truly decouple. We get that. Um, but when it comes to fundamentally protecting our equities, they can only be protected by working together. And I think one of the solutions on supply chains will not be everybody bring their supply chains home. I, even in the United States, I think we see that as impractical. But increasingly, we, we want to make sure that our supply chains are resilient in part because we're we're trading and integrating with people that we can have relatively uh, confidence that they're going to follow the rule of law, that they're politically stable, um, and that they'll be with the United States if there is a competition. So. Um, so there might be more commonality there than you might think. Uh, certainly, um, uh, what's in the offing with, for under a second term would be a U.S.-U.K. FTA. I think that's absolutely without question. I, I think a U.S.-Taiwan FTA at this point is almost inevitable. Um, mm -hmm. The Taiwanese uh, uh, making this decision on pork and beef, I, that just cleared the field. I, 
And uh, I just think that's going to happen. And, and the reality is, is once you get a U.S. Taiwan FTA, we are going to creep back to something that looks more like T, uh, TPP um, in some form. That's going to happen, I think, regardless, Democrat, Republican president. Uh, and I do think that there is a uh, even a, a, in, a, in a second Trump administration, there's going to be some kind of U.S.-EU agreement. It's not going to be the big comprehensive TP, which I thought was never practical, but there's going to be agreements in individual sectors because it's to the mutual benefit of the U.S. and uh, and the EU to do that because we've got to get the economies of the free world running post-COVID. The, the big dramatic focus of this administration, which you would definitely see in the second term, is much of their uh, focus is, is on how do we get private sector engagement and involvement in key strategic theater. So the clearest one of that, for example, is the Three Seas Initiative. This is this uh, large initiative of Central European countries to work on infrastructure, digital infrastructure uh, and energy. Um, administration's been a big supporter of that. They put money into that. 100% would expect if there was a Biden administration, they would do exactly the same thing. Um, I, so I, uh, and looking where we bring the private sector in to really leverage that capability to strengthen economic partners, I think that's a coming thing, again, regardless of whether it's Democrat or Republican. Uh, I would like to follow up on the international organization thing, which, and I, and, I, and I think, you know, Kathleen probably agrees with me on this. You know, we, in the 90s, we looked at international organizations as the, the great hope in the sense that these would be forums in which we would establish international norms that we would all follow and it would mitigate conflict and competition. The reality is, is that is not how China views these organizations and, um, and, 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 and not how Russia or Iran do either, although their, their influence is, of course, much less. International organizations have really become a battleground between countries that would like to sustain their normal role of international norm setting um, and countries which would like to use these organizations to drive their agenda. And so much, regardless of what we think about IOs and regardless of what you think about the, the, the squabble over the WHO, the reality is, is what's happening is only happening because, because China is, has a conscious strategy and policy of getting senior officials in there, of changing policies to affect their, their uh, things like in ICAO, you know, with, with pushing Taiwan out, pushing them out of WHO. Um, whether you wanna stay, reform, replace or go out and set up your own thing, you're gonna to have to go through these organizations you know, kind of one, on one each and develop an appropriate strategy to protect your interests in equities in all cases. I think the, the, uh, a Biden administration would find itself doing much the same things. And it, so it's, it, uh, and, and I think Europeans will increasingly find themselves following much, much the, the same policies. You know, and WHO is a very good example. The administration put out a list of reforms that the WHO would have to take. And the United States, you know, would stay because we're not actually leaving. Um, so now we've got, I think we've got eight months left. Um, it's very unlikely the WHO is going to follow through on those. So even if, even if a Biden administration wanted to go back to WHO, the reforms that it would need to do that are not going to be there. And they will, like the current administration, they will have to make plans on how do you do public health policy globally without the WHO. And the reality is we can do that. We did it under PETFAR. Uh, that's a model that we can employ globally. And any American president uh, could and probably will do that. So I think it's a much a much mixed bag for the future of international organizations. And I think uh, Washington policies will adopt to that, whether they're led by Republicans or Democrats. Well, let me jump in to ask a quick second question before we open it up, which is, um, James, you recently wrote a piece about Secretary Pompeo's Middle East trip, strengthening U.S. ties with Arab nations and Israel. I would expect continuity, and there's been deeper engagement in the Middle East by the Trump administration. Um, would there be any twists and turns, in your view, in a, in a Trump two administration, and Kathleen, uh, what would you expect would be a Biden administration's priorities in, in that very same region? So I'll, I'll offer one comment and then I'll offer one gentle issue for the Biden team and it's not partisan political, so please don't take it that way. It's just an objective assessment. I, I think where this administration is heading is really something like, I don't know what they're calling it now, the Middle East, security architecture, the Middle East strategic front, whatever. But I think that ultimately what this administration would like to see is 
the, the Gulf countries cooperating with Israel, working with Iraq and Egypt in kind of common alignment for collective security and also, and much, much more importantly, for economic integration to really start to gain the benefits of linking these economies together and growing real peace and prosperity for their people. So blocking Iran and really kind of bringing the kind of economic prosperity to, to the region that would really bring um, growth and development and better governance and more democracy and everything else. That, I think that's that's what they are working toward. That would, would they continue to work towards the last four years. It's not an altruistic policy in any stretch of imagination. Uh, the administration does not want to be bogged down policing the Middle East for the rest of its life. And, and we're looking for a solution. And I, I think this is, you know, quite admirable. The United States has always kind of, you know, been, you know, schizophrenic on this. We jump into the Middle East with both feet and try to fix everything. And then we pick up all our toys and go home and try to ignore it. And, and there's got to be a sustained way to do that. And so that's their vision. I would and, and I would I was the biggest critic of that four years ago when they talked about this in the transition team. I go, you guys are you know smoking something in the back room. But I, I, I think they've actually made concrete strides in that direction. And, and I think that's where their goal. So here's and I think any administration would be smart to follow with that. I think here's the challenge for a Biden team. And again, it's not meant to be partisan. I just mm -hmm. um, and both political parties have factions that have are, are not pro-Israeli. This is a big change in American politics where for a long time, Israel is kind of a bipartisan issue. Um, both parties have their critics. Um, it's much bigger on the left. Um, there's a significant portion of the left that that favors the Palestinian cause and, and, and pa over over the strategic relationship with Israel. That's a challenge for a president that's trying to knit together a, uh, a cohesive Middle East strategy where Israel has to be a key component of that. Again, both political parties have lots of people that would love to just throw the relationship with Egypt or Turkey or Saudi Arabia under the bus for all kinds of issues, some real, some imagined, some very legitimate concerns on democracy. Um, but the reality is, is if you, if you can conceive of a Middle East policy where it doesn't have the United States working with Saudi Arabia, Egypt, and Turkey, let me know. I'd be excited to hear that. These are, these are tr certainly troubled, problematic country, but the notion of just kind of walking away from them, I don't know how that works either. And again, both political parties have people that would well, be happy to do that, but there's a large, a large call for that on the left. And I just think that is something that uh, the Biden team will really have to struggle with where half of their supporters really don't want to deal with half of the countries that you'd have to mm -hmm. deal with to, to move a policy forward. And again, it's, it's not a criticism, it's just an observation. Yeah, I can um, talk a little bit about that because that is a challenge that um, James identified, but it's actually not even as um, clear as that because there are what maybe this more centrist Democrats who also are just, um, have, have decided that our Middle East policy has drained too many resources um, throughout the decades, and that we maybe have overemphasized the importance of the Middle East in our foreign policy. And then there are ones who want us to engage more robustly. So it's not even just the left, center left pull on the Democratic Party, but also within those who are tired of our, and look at the amount of billions of dollars we've invested mostly militarily in the Middle East and have, what you've seen for it. So there's a lot of contract come pulling on, the Biden, on a potential Biden administration. I do think on some issues, um, I think Saudi Arabia, um, Biden has been pretty tough on Saudi Arabia throughout his, his career. Um, and I don't think um, that would change. I think he even might be tougher as president. I think there might be the biggest difference probably would be approach to Saudi Arabia. In terms of specifics, again, that would have to be evaluated in the broader context of the Middle East. But historically, he's been very, very difficult, very tough on Saudi Arabia, and I think that would be a significant change. He has indicated um, uh, publicly that he would not move our embassy out of Jerusalem. Um, that's been part of that has been a decision that uh, was made by the Trump administration and would not change. Um, the Biden administration, the Biden administration also has publicly stated that they would support a two-state solution again in, in the Middle East. Um, but many of the things would be carryovers from the Obama administration. But I do think there will be tensions within uh, a Biden administration about how robustly we get involved in the Middle East, 
what does that mean? Is it diplomatically? Is it militarily? Is it security-wise? How much do we continue investing the billions of dollars? What would be our priorities? Um, I think on you know, the big issues, it's, it probably would be the one that will be most uh, debated within a Biden administration is our approach to the Middle East. I think there's more clear-cut consensus on Russia and China, on Iran, um, but I think within the Middle East will be how to how do you, what becomes the predominant approach will still be uh, have to be something that will be tested by time, but also by tested by circumstances. Thank you. I'm going to turn now to Maria, as who has been following questions in the in the queue in the chat, and see if she has a question for either of you or both. Is she on? If not, I'll continue asking. <laughs> Is she coming? Maria? I'm trying to turn my mic on and my camera on. Can you see me? Not yet. We can hear you. Now we can't. Here we go. Yeah. We can't hear you. <laughs> Sorry about that. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. All right. Perfect. So we're going to open this up for Q&A from the audience. So if you have a question, please type it in the chat box and I will be reading those out loud. But while we wait for for the people to to think of up their questions and put them in, Deborah, if you still had questions in mind, please continue. And I'm going to be monitoring the, I'm going to be focusing on monitoring the chat and uh, picking up questions from there. Okay, no problem. Um, I wanted to pivot back to, to China. Yesterday in the summer session, there was quite an extensive uh, discussion about China from different points of view. Um, and I wanted to ask whether it's a Trump two administration, Biden one which is engagement with China beyond certain economic issues. There has been a shift you know, from engagement to strategic competition. I think on both sides, Democrats and Republicans, there is a consensus we've moved into you know, uh, big power competition. But yet there is a structure that has been modified but still stands to engage more deeply on global challenges with China. Would a Trump II administration expand dialogue with China to include such issues as possibly health um, and others go back and talk about cyber in a dialogue sense and not just through sanctions? And for you, Kathleen, do you think a Biden administration would use that same framework or or adapt it, change it, modify it? Okay, Kathleen, you like, you wanna, okay Kathleen, James, you Kathleen go ahead. No, um, you know, on China, the big question is how decoupled will we be? Um, and in terms of this great power competition, and each, each, each stage of decoupling becomes a greater uh, risk to all of us. So I do think in certain areas, and Biden, and again, go back to the climate change, uh, the acknowledgement is if climate change is going to be a very top priority for the Biden administration. There is acknowledgement that the U.S. alone cannot, uh, would not be effective in having a meaningful impact on climate change, that China has to be part of the, the discussion, has to be part of the negotiations. So I think on, on China particularly, I think um, both the Biden administration and the Trump administration shares the same concerns about how China is using its leverage in places. And I saw the one question is in Africa. I think that, you know, China is places the concern about China's global reach um, and how it's reaching is a shared concern. So how their response would be. I do think um, there might be a greater uh, willingness to engage with some of our allies and partners and trying to figure out how do you respond to China, both economically and technologically. So on the 5G issue particularly, do we work closely with European countries and allies and how do you develop an effective alternative uh, on 5G and some of the other emerging technologies that China is taking a lead? So there might be a more collaborative platform with others to figure out a response to China. 
But I don't think a full decoupling is going to happen. I think it, uh, that would be dangerous for all of us to have a full decoupling of a relationship with China. But where do you, where do you know, uh, identify the areas where you would work together becomes a challenge. So, you know, I think it would be good to start and go back and talk about what's changed under American foreign policy towards China. And I often do a, a thought experiment in, in which I argue with people that if Hillary Clinton would be elected president, would our foreign policy towards China really be that much different today? Uh, and, and, and sometimes I wonder if it actually would be. So if you look at our traditional policy towards China, I often describe it as the blazing saddles strategy, which is a metaphor which works less and less because nobody remembers blazing saddles anymore. So this is a movie, so there's a character Mongo, he was Alex Karras, a tough American football player. And, and the, the joke in the movie was, you know, don't shoot Mongo, you might make him mad. And, and I think that essentially was our emerging policy towards China. As the, the panda huggers and the panda haters were debating each other about whether the rise of China was be good or bad, the, 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 the mainstream of American foreign policy was let's engage China and look for a constructive outcome and, and you know, ignore, or not ignore, but you know, de-emphasize and look for areas of commonality. The, the shift in our policy is really to invert that is rather than ignoring the issues of contention between the United States and China, let's find those pain points like the acupuncturists and focus on them. And that by challenging China in areas where they're impinging on our vital interests and making China realize and respect those, we're likely actually to get stability in the long term. That I think is fundamentally the US strategy, not actually decoupling. Um, there, is there a place for engagement in that strategy? And the answer is yes, but, right? So even under the Obama administration, we saw efforts to do this. And one of the most notable was, is Obama negotiated um, the cyber the cybersecurity agreement with the Chinese, which I would point out the Chinese largely followed. Um, you know, before that you had literally tens of thousands of Chinese hackers that were, you know, all kind of going after stuff in America, working on bounty. And, uh, and, and Obama said it has to stop. And, and largely the Chinese government followed the letter of the agreement and they did do that. What they largely did was they took all those hackers, they brought them into a civil military structure, they focused them in a different direction, and they've continued a lot of the, the Chinese espionage, but through UMIT and other means. So yeah, you can reach a deal with Chinese, but it doesn't mean that, that an engagement with the Chinese is actually affecting the underlying competition and structure. You know, we, we've seen this with um, with the Trump administration. The Trump administration has actually done engagement on economic matters. They they have a trade deal. And, and I actually think that trade deal is largely going to hold. It's going to hold because in the end, the Chinese really need American agricultural products to feed their people. And, they, and they've got to buy stuff from us. But that I, I don't think that's a precursor to the, the underlying competition between the two powers. So I'm not sure engagement gets us all the way there. There is actually a prominent area in which the Trump administration is really seeking engagement with the Chinese, and that's on arms control. Uh, and I think rightly recognizing that the only stable arms control regime in the 21st century is one that China, Russia, and the US all agree to. But again, having an arms control agreement is, doesn't affect that underlying um, competition. And, and fundamentally, I go back to the point that I, that I made before, China has a lot of cards to play. Um, it, we have seen Chinese diplomacy in the last couple of years that we have never seen. The notion of Chinese, we're, we're, hey, we're a rising developing nation. We don't even get involved in other people's business. I mean, that, that cloak has been entirely thrown off. And it's very likely that the, the Chinese would revert back to that. It'd be a great, lace of, great uh, uh, loss of face for Xi to do that. Um, so China has to decide how much of this uh, wolf warrior diplomacy are they gonna carry forward um, post, uh, post 2020. Um, and so a, a, a lot of this will be uh, determined on the Chinese willingness to engage. But I suspect in the near term, um, when people say, well, we have to engage with, the engagement with China will be tactical, it's not gonna be strategically transformative in the relationship. China's not ready for that. Thank you. Maria, uh, do we have a question or I have a, my list? We have a couple of questions from the audience. One of them has to do with China. So let's continue with the China theme for a while. 
China is building influence in Africa via financing and development projects. And simultaneously, China is char charting new ground on influencing the digital realm, social media, etc. How do the panelists see the alternative administrations position US on China's outreach on these two widely different areas? Africa on one hand and social media slash new technologies on the other. Uh, I can start. You, yeah. Is that okay? Yeah. All right. Um, I think this administration, well, first of all, I think, uh, again, I think this is bipartisan. The recognition that Chinese engagement in China is, is a problem, uh, sorry, Chinese engagement in Africa is actually a problem for the Africans. Uh, it can be deeply destabilizing. They are uh, facilitating corruption. They're facilitating an enormous amount of environmental damage and destruction. Um, they are affecting good governance, and uh, and potentially this will this will could um, lead a great destabilizing in Africa. This is a huge problem for Europe and for the Greater Middle East. Mm -hmm. It does us it does us no good to stabilize the Greater Middle East if Africa falls apart, because okay. everybody will flood into the Greater Middle East, and from there they will flood into Western Europe, and you know and and that's not good for anybody. Um, a stable, a stable, prosperous uh, nations in Africa are in all our interests. And China has, has, I think, gone to the top of the list of threats to that. Mm -hmm. And so the question is, is how do we engage with that? And and again, Republican, Democrat, nobody disputes this. We are not going to we are not going to win Africa by by out Chinese the Chinese. You know, we are not going to walk in with a checkbook. And, and write massive checks the way they did and, mm -hmm. and fuel corruption and, and bad governance and environmental degradation. So we have to develop an alternative model. This, this administration does get that. I, I think the, you will see from this administration a massive uh, effort on the public health front. And the reason for that is if you think about it, the, the U.S. under Republican and Democratic administrations, not just George Bush, Obama was great on PEPFAR, um, built, I, th I think, over 50 labs throughout Africa. Uh, all those labs can be linked together in a very effective uh, regional network for public health. Um, public health is a prime area where the U.S. can really step in, where it already has infrastructure and influence. Uh, and and really drive that. The other is, of course, private investment. Um, you, you know how you create conditions for that. So one of the things the U.S. is back, and I would suspect that this would, the Biden administration would embrace this just as much as this current one. We have this thing called the Blue Dot Network, which is this mm -hmm. common framework on on responsible investments in infrastructure that we, the Japanese and others, agree to. I think we would press that in Africa. Um, we would definitely. There's definitely an interest in partnering more with the Europeans, particularly with the European Union, on, on joint programs and policies that deliver real real change and development in Africa. Um, I, 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 I think that's there as well. And, you know, you know, the, the one thing about this administration is they've never opted to militarize solutions. They really haven't. I mean, they're not isolationists, but they're but they're definitely not neocons either. And in Africa, they have consciously sought how to restructure policy to de not to to de-emphasize the counterterrorism mission, but the the counterterrorism mission needs to be taken over by the indigenous people and 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 their law enforcement programs, their governance programs. The U.S. military can't plink its way out of that, and DOD doesn't want to do that, and the U.S. system doesn't want to do that. So they are looking to transform the military structure to not be essentially an instrument for mass counterterrorism in Africa. So, I, and I would expect, you know, look, um, you know, if, it, if that effort doesn't continue, regardless of who's president, that, that's a huge strategic blunder on the part of the United States. Yeah, I think in, um, what's clear from what James is saying and what um, I'm about to say is that we have not had a very complex cohesive, complicated approach yet to China. We've already, I think we're in the development, of a Trump two administration or a Biden one administration would have to come up with a China policy that we really haven't had. We've been doing it on a much more ad hoc basis, but systematically and across the board, we need to think about where do we respond to China, whether it's in Africa, as, as James mentioned, is one of the key areas. And we've seen the, the economic cost of Africa's dependence on China right now um, because of the, the requirements of project financing, you can go on and on. 
I do think um, we'll have a much more cro- across the board approach to China and uh, look at it in terms of both its threats, the areas that James identified as well, the nuclear proliferation, global health areas, or maybe areas we can work together. But I think you need to see it'll be much more of a focus and probably the focus that we'll have the Indo-Pacific China will probably be the foreign air, foreign policy area and priority for whatever administration is in place after January 20th. Um, I also think the maybe a slight difference is that the Biden administration will um, build up USAID and actually has, has indicated that it wants to increase USAID budget and actually its ability and expand it um, more than it has been under this administration. So we would make AID maybe a more pre, have a more preeminent preeminent role in development than it has in the last few years. Um, but even that has to change with the times. So it's not going to be the typical development projects that it has. It has to change to address the more competitive. And you've seen even AID under this administration looking at issues of technologies and the spread of technology. So I think you'll see AID change significantly, both in terms of its focus, its approach, its resources under a Biden administration. Thank you. Can I, can I just mm-hmm. follow up on that? First of all, I want to say that I think we'd all be better off if we just threw these guys aside and Kathleen and I ran the country. <laughs> uh, um, here, here. But um, her report on USAID is not to be missed. You know, we, we, we created, I guess, the Defense Finance Corporation and USAID, and now we're going back and looking at the Export-Import Bank. And it's very clear they have to learn how to do business differently. Um, and we have to have projects that have more strategic focus and, and actually are producing deliverables on the ground of better outcomes. Um, this is a challenge in the U.S. system where a lot of especially USAID and other people's work is really opera- operationalized through various NGOs, which you know are which honestly have been very comfortable doing the business they've always been doing, and they're they're always happy when an administration comes along and they have some great new bumper sticker and they're great. So they take the bumper sticker and say cool, and then they just keep doing what they're doing, right? They really don't want to change, and. And for them, I, look, maybe this sounds cruel, it's about what, how much money is coming in the door rather than how, what are our outcomes coming outside the door. Now, look, I think there's a win-win there for the U.S. and the NGO community. These NGOs can do good in the world and they can prosper and they can build good programs, but they also have to deliver on things that are going to make America and its interests better and produce better outcomes for the people they are serving. Um, I, I think we can get there. But the problem is, is um, every time we try to do these reforms, they tend to, to break down in battles between, oh, you want to cut and change. You don't like these programs. And, and people whose definition of healthy programs are, are you just giving them more money? And if we can't get beyond that, um, and then these guys, you know, look, essentially getting re- whoever will side with them, Republicans or Democrats, they don't really care, you know, getting them to defend bigger budgets and, and not acknowledge reforms. So if there's anything where we really, if we really want to do better, we're going to need a bipartisan consensus on really restructuring uh, reforms for great power competition. Otherwise, you know, we're, we're, you know, we're just going to, you know, devolve back into this debate about well, how much money are you going to give us? Sorry, I didn't mean to go on the soapbox. All right, thank you. We have a lot of questions now, (laughs) so. One question is about uh, tensions in the Mediterranean area, in the wider sense, Syria, Turkey, Greece, Cyprus, Libya. Uh, How likely are we to see a more interventionist or active administration if Biden uh, will be the next president? Um, uh, The person asking the question claims that the Trump approach has been to leave it up to the Europeans to deal with these situations, and uh, he sees that probably to to continue if Trump will get a second term. But what do you think about that? Um, Well, I can I can start with that question Um, as uh, having been ambassador to Cyprus until about um, 18 months ago, obviously the eastern Mediterranean is an area that I'm I'm quite familiar with. Um, And, you know, the Biden administration, um, the Obama administration and Vice President Biden himself was very interested in in the eastern Mediterranean as a vice president and actually took a great interest in both uh, what was happening between Greece and Turkey and in Cyprus as well. Um, Obviously, probably when you talk about things that have changed the most uh, between an Obama administration and and during the Trump administration is Turkey's 
um, role in the Eastern Med and its emergence as a, a much more difficult player in the Eastern Med. Um, its actions in Syria, um, Vice President Biden criticized significantly. Uh, and so I think the big difference, um, big challenge for both a Biden one administration and a Trump two administration is Turkey on this and in in its role in the, in the region, um, both in terms of relationship with Syria, but also its relationship with Greece. Um, I think uh, the, the Vice President Biden had a relationship with President Erdogan at one time. Um, I'm not sure that, that uh, positive relationship that happened several years ago would carry over because of the changing nature of President Erdogan and his approach in global affairs. So again, I think in terms of those areas that um, we talk about as fraught areas that could rise to greater tensions, I think the Eastern Med is one of those that is potentially um, a very fraught area, not just in traditional sense in terms of Syria right now or Israel or Lebanon. If you look at all the countries in the Eastern Med, uh, Lebanon in terms of its instability right now after it's the destruction that happened in Syria and the conflict between two NATO, potential conflict between two NATO partners, Turkey and Greece. Um, right now it is in uh, the EU is taking a role, but I don't know if any one nation can take a role that would actually solve this crisis. There's so many over, overlays of issues that are there. You know, it, it'd be great if there was a thematic or grand strategy approach to resolve security issues within the, the transatlantic community, but there si simple, it simply isn't. You know, so for example, if you're a big proponent of European strategic autonomy, that sounds great. Let the Europeans solve their own problems. I actually think President Trump would be very sympathetic to something like that. Of course, the problem is, is then what, what do you do when there's squabbles inside Europe? Well, all of a sudden they're difficult to address because we're all trying to be strategically autonomous and, and of one voice, but what happens when we all disagree on what we want? Um, so th the reality is, is within the transatlantic community, the, there's, there's always gonna be baskets of Europeans should lead, you know, Americans should stay out, America should lead because America is the only one that can lead. We need to work on this in partnership. It's always going to be that messy. And, um, you know, while you would say, you know, the, the administration's kind of disengaged from Europeans and say, you guys solve your own problems. Um, look, I mean, there are cases where the U.S. hasn't done that. Uh, Kosovo, Serbia is, is one where the United States has really stepped forward um, and made a very, very sincere effort to try to, to normalize relations between Kosovo and Serbia, which are, I think, really the key to unlocking the Western Balkans. Unlocking the Western Balkans really opens up the peace and prosperity of Southern Europe. That's good for Europe as a whole. Um, Ukraine, where the U.S. has been, I think, much more actually forward-leaning than Europeans in, in uh, supporting the Ukrainians and stabilizing um, Georgia, U.S.-Georgian relationship, I think, is Europe's actually been the great benefit of the efforts that the United States has had in, in trying to strengthen relations with Georgia. So this administration's not absent. I, I, I think their 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 measure is what's efficacious. Where where does it make sense for America to to step in and work together? And you know we don't always get it right. Actually, one I would point to is Syria, which is of course not a you know, but it is a European interest, and a number of European interests have interests in Syria. The problem with, no, I'm sorry, not Syria, but Libya. The, the problem with Libya, of course, is everybody has an interest, but nobody really has the power, authority, or capacity to, to, to solve things in real direction. So we have you know, the French, the Italians, the, the Turks, uh, the UAE, everybody pulling in different directions, and the, and the, the Libyan people are, are suffering for that. And that's one, for example, I've argued where there should be a, a more robust diplomatic role for the United States in, in breaching that. I'm not sure in, in this situation if there is a, a, a large um, um, role for the, the United States. I will say that um, you know, no, nobody wins in destabilizing the Mediterranean. Turkey is certainly not the winner of that. And and for for you know our friends that want to you know, like throw Turkey under the bus, and I'm not disagreeing that Turkey is not a problematic country. Is the reality is is Turkey has limits of where it can go. It can never achieve true Turkish strategic autonomy. Uh, it can never recreate the Ottoman Empire. It can never rely on Russia and Iran to. To, to carry its weight at the end of the day. Um, Turkey can't drift very far from the camp. Uh, and I, I think that's always something that we have to keep in mind when we try to figure out how to, how to work with the Turks. Thank you. We have a comment from the audience that they would like to hear more on issues of climate change and also on uh, 
the presidential candidates very different approaches to multilateralism and i actually had a couple of questions in mind uh with regards to climate change one different question for for each of you if i may um i i was hoping to hear from james a little more about how you see the trump administration's um position to energy transition fossil fuels Trump has been very keen to protect and even promote the coal industry and even import fossil fuels, trying to sort of um, cling to this idea that fossil fuels are still going to be very relevant in the future. But the rest of the world mostly seems to be trying to move on, trying to move to clean energy and to make this transition happen. So if Trump were to get a second term, how do you see this... Um, Trump policy impacting American economy and sort of the American, the, the standing the U.S. has in the world. If they're going to be one of the only countries, the U.S. and Russia are going to be clinging to fossil fuels and most of the rest of the world moves on. And um, a different question for Kathleen. Biden has now been campaigning on being a very active on, on the, in the fight against climate change. So how do you see if he were to, to win and be president, do you think that the U.S. would really step up and start uh, exerting its influence to really make this a key question in American foreign policy and try and push other countries, use its leverage to make other countries uh, really take the fight against climate change seriously? Mm -hmm. Well, I, you know, I think the, the key in public policy is divorcing climate change from an environmental issue and climate change is a political issue. And, you know, when, when, when people look at the negative reaction to climate change from Republicans, there's this notion about denying dealing with environmental issues in that. And, the, and that's not the bulk of what Republicans are pushing back against, they're pushing back against the political agenda. So for example, in the United States, we have something called the Green New Deal. Uh, the Green New Deal purports to be a massive program to deal with climate change. If you look at the Green New Deal, it's, it's basically a political agenda to deal with all kinds of things. Nothing wrong with having a political agenda to deal with all kinds of things. Conservatives have political agendas. But the notion of just saying all this is about climate change is simply not true. I mean, the fundamental challenge that conservatives had with the, the Paris Agreement was, one, it wouldn't actually deliver on effective results on climate change. Um, and two, it would result in a massive redistribution of wealth, which would, again, not guarantee any good outcomes. If you're giving a massive amount of money to governments that are corrupt and venal, what leads you to believe that they're actually going to deliver better environmental outcomes? These are these are practical concerns. They weren't a rejection of the climate change issue per se. And so when you say, well, what drives the administration's view on climate change? I think the answer is physics. I mean, you know, we have not yet seen a major industrial economy figure out how to transition to solar power or, or uh, you know, windmills. Um, Germany's made a great transition, largely by buying electricity from France, which generates electricity with nuclear power. Um, look, so the reality is, is I think this administration is excited to embrace energies that have less pollutants and are cleaner and are economically make sense. They're as thrilled as anybody to do that when the physics delivers programs that can do that. And we're actually seeing that in the United States. I mean, look at the, the growth of the electric car industry in the United States, which is phenomenal. And it's, and it's not even really a government run program. Um, I think, you know, natural gas, uh, the United States sees natural gas as part of the solution. Natural gas is, is not a pollutant. Uh, the United States sees nuclear energy as part of the solution. It's, it's not a pollutant either. Um, so I actually think if you, um, if you look at the actual programs the U.S. government is doing, although they're actually loath to put the term climate change on there because it's such a politically charged, loaded term in the United States, it's not just a matter of orthodoxy, maybe like it is in Europe. And where if you wanted to kill something and, and, and completely eliminate conservative support, just put the word climate change on it. But I'll give you an example, which is look at the again, look at the three C's initiative. One of the pillars of the three C's initiative is energy. And the United States has been very clear. It's very supportive of clean energy projects as part of the three C's initiative. If they're you know economically feasible, if the private sector is willing to invest them and they're efficacious, the U.S. would be the first to step up and say, yeah, do more of that. 
I do think this is probably one of the biggest differences between a Trump two administration and Biden administration, where I think you would have a very activist Biden administration on climate change, both in terms of foreign policy, in terms, but also more so even on domestic policy. And the Democratic Party platform has actually uh, envisioned almost two trillion dollars to be spent on clean energy, and actually promises to reduce um, U.S. economy to net zero emissions by 2050. So this is a pretty strong affirmation of what a domestic policy would be of a, a Biden administration, um, and also would include many more nationwide energy efficiency issues. Uh, there's been a lot of controversy in U.S. newspapers about what Biden's position is on, fra- on fracking um, uh, per Biden's uh, uh, platform. There won't be fracking on public lands. Um, and so there's a difference between the two administrations potentially. But I do think you would see a much more domestically prioritization of climate change issues related to issues, um, a real commitment to that, and also not only just a re-entering of the Paris Agreement, but actually maybe an intent to renegotiate it to make the goals even more ambitious uh, than they are right now, and actually more um, compliance with Paris Club. Uh, with the Paris Agreement, climate change agreement. So I think this is probably one of the areas that would be most fundamentally different between the two administrations would be the emphasis on climate change. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question. We have a question about the US, Russia, China triangle. (laughs) So um, (laughs) the question Mm. is if the US wants um, and needs Russia to really be with us, with the U.S. Um, in to, to really have an effective reaction and, and counter to China, or if it's enough to sort of just ask Russia to stay out of it and uh, not take China's side. Hmm. Happy to start. Very passionate <laughs> about this. Um, Russia can and would do nothing for the free world to help address the challenge, destabilizing challenges of China. And not only would they do nothing, they would demand a very high price for that. Um, So there's there's zero value. Uh, Look, I'm all for engaging with Russia, but I think we all have to be realistic. You know, uh, until we have a different Putin, we're not going to have a different Russian foreign and security policy. And the one we have now is deeply problematic. Um, I think um, using poisons so everybody would know exactly who poisoned uh, Russian dissidents uh, is this is this guy is beyond the pale. Um, he wants people to know that he is poisoning people in his own country um, with a wink, wink, and it is a threat to all of us. Uh, look, I don't. I, I think Russia's a declining power. Uh, the problem with declining powers is they can be just as dangerous. I think it's a, it's a manageable threat for Europe and the United States. Uh, there, it, you know, if Russia wanted to bring something really significant to the table for reset, that'd be great. But I don't think they have much to bring, and I don't think they're willing to bring that. Um, conversely, um, Russia and China really cannot do much for each other. Uh, they've never demonstrated great willingness to really go to the bat for each other. They don't have really much to offer each other um, other than cheap energy. And, uh, you know, quite honestly, the Chinese have been storing up so much oil. You know, Iran and, and Russia could probably disappear and the Chinese could still probably fuel their oil thing forever. Um, you know, I just, just know they're there. So the, to, to mitigate U.S. relations with either Russia or China premised on the relationships between Russia and, and China is just a loser. I, I, I just don't think you can get there from here. You've just got to deal with each country on its own. Yeah, and again, this is more of a personal opinion because I'm not sure how the Biden administration would do this, but I also was been struck about Russia's relationship with China, having lived in Russia in the mid-2000s and actually traveled out to the Russian Far East and I was really struck how Chinese the Russian Foreign East is. You would think that Russia would have feel more of the threat from China than it does. And it's and it really sh- has struck me over the years that it hasn't responded in a way that would also put pressure on China. Um, but working together, I think our interests are too different right now to work with Russia on, on counter- countering the Chinese influence. Thank you. You actually kept it so brief that I think we have time for at least one more question. <laughs> they do keep coming, which is, which is great. Thank you, audience. So here's a question. How do you see the U.S. role in Balkans, and especially with Kosovo-Serbia dialogue? And will there be a change if there's a regime change? 
Go ahead, Kathleen. Already. Uh, I, I, yeah, I think, I mean, what um, Serbia Kosovo is the issue that um, the Biden administration under the Obama administration took very great interest in. I think you'd see a continuity of involvement on the issue between the two. The Balkans, as, as James actually rightfully noted, it is key to the stability of uh, Southeast Europe as having Balkan stability. And I think you'd see in a continued engagement. Would it be exactly the same strong role or more behind the scenes role? I'm not sure. But I think the interest is would continue on both on both administrations. Yeah, you know, I would say this really isn't Serbia's interest. I mean, um, if, if Serbia, no, nobody's asking Serbia to say, you know, do nothing with the Russians or kick the Chinese out. Nobody's saying that. What we are saying is that if you want to be a free and independent country and not somebody's suburb, you need to diversify your interests. So all the great powers, I mean, and this was kind of the key to the independence of many Balkan countries during the Ottoman Empire. You have to diversify your interests so everybody has a stake in wanting you to be stable and prosperous. And the way you would do that is you expand your engagement with Western Europe and the United States, which actually are, are the larger investors in Serbia than Russia or China today. The key for Serbia to do that is to normalize relations with Kosovo. Mm -hmm. there, the, that caught, I mean, other than maybe politically unpopular in some circles, that costs Serbia nothing. And it is the key to opening, I think, everything for Serbia's future. Uh, and it's, and it, I think, removes the single greatest obstacle to a, a really prosperous Serbia. And I think when, pros when Kosovo and Serbia are living side by side in peace, you know, it puts a lot of pressure on the rest of the Western Balkans and it opens up a lot of good things for everybody. So I, I, these are two tiny countries, mm -hmm. um, but I think the, the consequences for peace are huge, but I, I really do think it's in the hands of the Serbians. And I think they just have to, you know, recognize that normalization of relations with Kosovo is absolutely in their best interest and, and would be transformative in their relationship with Western Europe and the United States. Thank you. One more lightning round. Venezuela <laughs> and Cuba. Do you see? How do you see the U.S. Uh, policy evolving? If um, well, comparing and contrasting these two possible administrations. Mm. Go ahead, Kathleen. Uh, um, I, I agree with Kathleen. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I'd say, unfortunately, Latin America has not been given the prioritization in recent administrations, and that includes uh, both the Trump administration and the Obama administration prior to that, that it should. Latin America is something that I think too many administrations have taken for granted, being our neighboring region. And um, I think that um, some of the differences on and maybe not the activist role in terms of Venezuela, I think with human rights issues would be much more emphasized under Obama, uh, a Biden administration, a continuation of some of the interests that Obama had uh, in the region. Um, but also some of the issues we've also talked about, the Chinese influence in Latin America is also a growing concern. Um, the rise of more authoritarian and ism in Latin America, I think, will also be a greater concern to uh, a Biden administration. So some of the trend lines will demand attention, um, that it hasn't uh, generated enough attention by recent administrations. And I put that as a plural. Um, and I think I yeah. leave it at that. You know, I, you know, I would, again, I'm not part of the, I would actually argue that the Trump administration has actually done better than recent and, and, and much more than people thought. I mean, US, Mexico, Canada trade deal. U.S. and Mexico actually were quite well on a lot of issues. Um, not that Mexico doesn't have a lot of problems all its own. The U.S. This administration has actually worked very well with Central America, worked well with Brazil, regardless of what you think about the state of their democracy. Um, definitely recognizes the concerns about Chinese influence in this administration. I actually think we're, we've, we've been kind of moving in the right direction in Latin America. I'll see more of that. But clearly, I think that this administration has no appetite for engagement with Cuba at all. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, so I, I, that might be one in which I'm sure there would be voices to say the Obama policy made more sense. Let's go back to that. But that that voice would get no broken in a second Trump term. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you very much. And thank you to our audience. Deborah, did you have something, final words or? Well, no, just to compliment our two guests for, uh, you know, a tour d'horizon that went <laughs> truly around the world. Um, and I think outlined very clearly where there is definite continuity in foreign affairs, irrespective of who wins. 
um, slight differences, but I think it gave the audience a very good idea of, you know, what to expect in 61 days. Well, actually, no, transition. <laughs> well, <in> who knows? <laughs> <laughs> or who knows when the decision is made. So, but thank you very much. Thank you, Kathleen. Thank you, James. And thank you, Maria, and the whole FIA team for, for putting this together. I agree. It was a very comprehensive uh, look on on a lot of issues and thank you deborah thank you for hosting and thank you for for helping us put this together and uh you're welcome so the Thanks. next next webinar will be a month stay tuned and you'll hear more about it thank you everybody thank you bye-bye